live from John Hammond Street with digital address GA0066714. This is Midday Live on Adesawe. My name is Park Siasari. Coming up in the next 60 minutes. Largest opposition party, the National Democratic Congress, addresses press conference today to respond to pressing national issues. Also, Electoral Commission rejects suggestions eight officers were involved in thumbprints and ballot papers in recent referendum. Also, the National Council for Curriculum Assessment responds to critics. History textbooks for basic schools is an attempt to project J.B. Dankwa and change history. And elsewhere, U.S. President Donald Trump vetoes bail passed by Congress to end support for the Saudi-led war in Yemen. We've got details of these stories plus many more coming up in the next 60 minutes. Be reminded that we're streaming live on Facebook. You can also join us with your views, comments and suggestions on any of our top stories this hour. Visit any of our social media pages on Facebook and on Twitter. Right, so the largest opposition party, the National Democratic Congress, is currently holding a press conference. My colleague Martin Isidudate is at the NDC headquarters. Let's go live for updates on this press conference. To be used is deployed to uh, the existing districts before about 40 or so other districts were created. So these new districts don't even have the equipment. So what will happen is that if we allow the proposal to stay. It will mean that people within the new district will also move to the parent districts in order to get their names registered. And you can imagine the problems that this could create. As I said, the NDC is indeed opposed to any system of registration that will be limited to the district offices of the EC. Evidence available shows that it is a system that will end up disenfranchising many qualified potential voters. Let's use two examples to illustrate this point. First, take the district of um, Bole Bamboy. People living in Bamboy, about 95 kilometers away from Bole, the district capital, will have to travel to Bole to register. And to make matters worse, I think Bole is still under curfew. <laughs> so having traveled 95 kilometers to the district capital, if you are lucky and you will reach there, then you must get the registration done before 6 o'clock, or else there will be curfew and you will not even know where to hide. The, the time, distance, energy, and expense involved are enough deterrence for any such voters. Mm -hmm. It will be the same situation for voters in Afram Plains north and south, where the terrain is most unfavorable, as the people will have to traverse several water bodies and hills before arriving at the district offices at uh, Donkokrum to register. We now proceed to give you, ladies and gentlemen, some background information before demonstrating to you with figures from the table we are going to provide how unacceptable this proposal is. The Electoral Commission deployed a biometric solution in 2012 with the objective of biometrically deduplicating registrants and preloading their fingerprint templates into devices for verification of identity of voters before they cast their vote. Though two biometrics were captured, i.e. the fingerprints and the fascia, the system has till date remained unimodal. 
That is, it uses only the biometric fingerprints for both identification and verification. The commission has mainly been involved in three categories of registration exercises since the 2012. One is the mass registration. Let the EC organized a nationwide mass registration between March 24th to May 5th, 2012. They projected an enrollment of 14 million voters using 7,000 biometric registration kits deployed at all centers across the country. In all, 14 million 148 thousand 890 voters were provisionally registered. After data processing and biometric deduplication, 13,000, uh, 13 million, I beg your pardon, let me take that again. In all, 14 million 158,890 voters were provisionally registered. After data processing and biometric deduplication, 13,724,000 370 distinct records remained on the all right, so we've just brought you live updates uh, of that press conference from the National Democratic Congress headquarters where my colleague Martin Asidu Date has been stationed all day. And meanwhile, the, uh, the New Patriotic Party is also holding a press conference. We'll bring you up to speed with regards to that uh, press conference uh, in our subsequent bulletins or as and when uh, news uh, trickles in. You're still watching Media Live here on TV3. Now, away from uh, politics, structures at Saglama Affordable Housing Unit Project have started developing cracks after work stalled almost two years ago. Now, some 645 detached and semi-detached buildings after completion remain unoccupied. It remains one of the many housing structures built with taxpayers' money left at the mercy of the weather. The $200 million parliamentary approved deal commenced in 2012, a major political campaign tool for the NDC at the time. Within the buildings, well fitted rooms with upholstery ready for use. The 5,000 unit apartments are not in the best of shape. It's, it's unbelievable. There's so many things we can do. We can at least give it to people on mortgage basis so that they live in and they pay. The foreman at the site is saying that it is left with the sewage that they have to connect into. They have to connect the buildings into the main sewage tank. It is nothing. Pipes left to rot, towels at the mercy of the weather. The new building is supposed showing signs of danger. Of the 1,412 units under the first phase, more than 600 are fully completed and ready for use. The minority side of the Parliamentary Select Committee on Works and Housing visiting the site in the Ningo Pram Pram constituency says the facility cannot be left in its current state. In view of the fact that the current housing deficit is estimated about 2 million housing units and growing, the minority demand the following. The government through the Minister of Works and Housing should go into immediate negotiation with contractor Michel's OS OAS Construlos Ghana Limited to enable them to go back to site to complete the first phase of the project. All the ancillary works needed to enable the occupation of the 636 housing unit completed so far should be done without further delay. Government should show proof of commitment as to the delivery of the 200,000 housing unit earmarked for the regional capitals as contained in the 2019 budget estimate in order to reduce the national housing de deficit. Since work stalled, several workers have been laid off. There are roughly 1,500 workers. What was the reason for laying them off? Because the production is not coming on anymore. We stopped work since uh, 2017 November. Tell me about the chemicals that we see right in the background. You've not worked with them, you've not used them. What are the effects of these things not being used and left here probably unattended to? Yes, because it's a long, it's a long time that we keep those things there. Uh, you can see yourself 
the sun has taken over. And now we cannot use it anymore, I believe so, even though I'm not a technical man, but the expiry date are on them, so you cannot use it. Because since we are not doing any uh, bunching, uh, the, the concrete, uh, these are used for the concrete, so since we are not doing anything like that, there is nothing we can do. Don't be deceived. They look beautiful from the outside, but nobody occupies them. This housing unit have been completed but left unoccupied because the government has caused an investigation into it. Well, the demands of the minority is that the government should allow people to occupy it whilst the investigations continue. They believe the taxpayers' money has been wasted as long as the building remains unoccupied. Komla Kluche, TV3 News, Saglemi. All right, so we're going to stay a while longer on this story. Uh, join us for more on this development. Is Executive Secretary of the Ghana Real Estate Developers Association, uh, Samuel Amega Yibo. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your time, uh, and thanks for joining us on Midday Live. You must be very worried about the situation. Ah, uh, certainly, yes. I mean, money going down the drain, uh, business opportunity lost, and all that. If you put all together, obviously, it's not the best situation we have. Mm -hmm. What should we be doing? I think um, we should get to the fundamentals right. Normally, before a housing project of this nature could have taken place, you would have sourced funding, know your source of funding for the project to its entirety, I mean, to its completion, and then also target those who are going to benefit. This too must work. And so this delay, this unfortunate situation where there's a new government in power, two years down the line, Nothing has happened to it since the uh, last government left. Mm -hmm. And then we hear there's investigation ongoing. People are also uh, in need of accommodation. I don't see why they cannot work it out such that the beneficiaries of this project could take over whilst these legal issues are uh, As Greta, out. what collaboration do you have with government with regards to the provision of uh, affordable housing? Um, there's no discussion for a particular project at the moment. And if you may know, you realize that all the housing projects that are in the news are being done almost by foreign entities. Some of them may have a few local partners, but you realize that uh, the local developers that we know, I mean, they, we have big names like the Regiment, the Death Trackers, Lakeside Estates, all these estates are there, but they are not doing anything for, for the government. And to what extent it's is... It's because we have not been engaged. You know, most of the well, engagement... Was Greta engaged in the Sagleme project? No, not at all. I mean, most of the time, we only get to know about this project that government has announced, that there's an, a, a project that is going to be taking uh, 1,000 houses there, 2,000 houses there. And we have always said that accommodation for the people is not by uh, execute and go approach. It is something that we are going to live with forever. Contract, marriages are being contracted every day. That is the example I normally, I, I normally give. Children are being born, their normal population keeps increasing. And so housing for the people cannot be done through execute and go approach. We must have a, a, a scheme that identifies the, a target group, have an effective mortgage system that finances it, get banks to work with us to provide the construction finance, and also put in a system that will be self-revolving. We could be able to do a number of units of houses, say, across the country, maybe 500 or 1,000 units in, let's say, every region. We should have a system where this thing can be done, put onto the market, sold out, investment recouped, and then there's more money, you know, to expand that area. And then we as we do the this, term affordable we, we build housing, capacity. But in the long term, these houses are not that affordable. Yeah, I, I wish that there's a government official here to explain what they mean themselves by affordable. Because if you look at the projects that have been executed by successive governments, if you do a simple calculation of the cost involved, as to the number of units that are normally turned out from those projects. It's, it's beyond what the local developers are doing that are not getting any support at all from government. And the local developers can't do it? We can't do it. What can't we do? The only difference between the local developers and these foreign developers that are normally contracted has always been financing uh, of they the project. They are able to pre-finance. Yes. And, and so if we cannot do the financing, what can we do? It's financial engineering. If we have financial gurus in this country, we have Bank of Ghana there with all the gurus in financial, you know. We have the private banks. We even have mortgage companies in this country. And you are telling me that all this 
uh, institutions don't have people who can do financial engineering to raise capital to bring into the country for affordable financing. I don't think so. They are just the not ready. It? What's the way forward? I think we should go back to the basics. We should, we should engage properly. We should devoid ourselves from uh, thinking that it's solely foreign sources that can provide affordable housing for us and do homegrown uh, approach to it. And I'm sure it will be more sustainable than what we are seeing today. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Samuel Amegaibo is the Executive Secretary of the Ghana Real Estate Developers Association. Join us uh, to talk a bit more on the issue of the Sagalame Housing Project, which has been left abandoned for many years. Now, away from housing, the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment has denied reports on the newly developed curriculum project, uh, that projects the achievement, I beg your pardon, of statesman J.B. Dankwa over Ghana's first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Now, according to NASA, the curriculum is structured to enable pupils learn the history of Ghana from the beginning and then progress, progress with personalities and events in a chronological manner. Now, NACA noted that while it appreciates and values public feedback on the new curriculum as an important element in helping to improve learning outcomes through a robust and responsive curriculum. Their work is based mainly on academic and professional considerations. Right, so we've just been joined in the studio by Professor uh, Kwame Osei-Kwatsen. He's the National Chairman for Curriculum and Assessment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Kwame Osei-Kwatsen, for your time, and good to have you in the studio. Yeah. Um, so what level of consultation uh, was done in coming up with this new curriculum? Yeah, we broadly consulted. In the first place, when the committee was constituted, chaired by me, we invited stakeholders in education who did presentations to us before we came out with the framework that is the new standard based curriculum framework based on the presentations that they made before we wrote our final report and submitted it to the ministry for our submission to the president or to the cabinet for adoption or for recommendation for us to do the review which we have done and it has resulted in the current document. Was there a problem with the old curriculum? It's often said that if it's not broken you don't fix it. Yeah, certainly there were some deficiencies in the old curriculum. What were the deficiencies? We, 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 we saw that this was more or less prescriptive and uh, it was more or less exams oriented even though there were some competencies that the students were supposed to learn out of the old curriculum, but because people and parents were more interested in their children passing the examination BEC and WASC so that they could further the education, the students were always interested not in the content and the pedagogy that is supposed to go with it. It should be child-centered so that the child goes through the pedagogy and at the end of the day is able to imbibe the skills or competencies that we want them to learn the values and what have you but these things were not adhered to and teachers did whatever pleased them what they would do so that their, their people could pass exams was what they were interested in and we realized that most of the time there was a league table so every school wanted to emerge on top of the league table and the was also there was also a report that in actual fact uh, most of the students at the end of the day who fail the exams, they will not pass and become dropouts. And you also look at the technological changes in the world. We are now in the fourth industrial revolution, digital age. And as the world changes, as society changes, as society is dynamic, you must also adjust to the changing patterns of society. Mm -hmm. So this was one of the uh, reasons or considerations that we considered in reviewing the curriculum. Reviewing. I'm sure you've had concerns about the new syllabus yeah. and, and about the fact that it seeks to unduly project uh, Dr. J.B. Dankwa over Kwame Nkrumah. What's your response to that? That is palpable falsehood. It's not borne out by any historical fact. Any person who says that uh, we want to project J.B. Dankwa over and above Kwame Nkrumah 
is doing that for political reasons. He has not perused the document, which a copy of which I have before me at your studios here. Now, what they did from the uh, investigations that I have done and people who have talked to me, and somebody had even confronted me uh, personally when I was doing my morning jogging on Saturday last. He was saying, shame on to me because you have projected J.B. Dankwa. So to what extent, this is the book that you have, to yeah. what extent is J.B. Dankwa mentioned in this book? The number of times J.B. Dankwa is mentioned in the book is irrelevant. Why? Because we are looking, if you look at the page, page four, mm -hmm. that is the first time you mention uh, J.B. Dankwa's name, it's mentioned. It's not mentioned because of anything, it's mentioned because of his intellectual output. He did the research about the origin of accounts, how our accounts migrated to this area, and the cultural similarities between the accounts in, in, in ancient Ghana. The, the, he said they began from, if you have read about J.B. Dankwa, anybody who has done history mm -hmm. and has studied about mm -hmm. the origin of accounts mm -hmm. at the university mm -hmm. will know that they say that J.B. Dankwa, from his perspective, he says that accounts originated from Sumeria, in ancient Mesopotamia, came to Egypt, and then there they move away from ancient Egypt to ancient Ghana Empire, where they formed, they established the ancient Ghana Empire, and he looks at their systems of inheritance, matrilinear, which is similar to the accounts of Ghana, the uh, chieftaincy practices, uh, human sacrifice after a chief is, there, is dead, somebody, then paid boys who sit in front of the chief holding. Uh, these sorts and what are those who are raising the issue about yeah. you trying to unduly uh, project JB over Kwame, uh, Kwame Kuma? Have you asked them why? You say, Have I asked them why? I, I haven't asked them to be honest with you, I mm -hmm. haven't asked them, but I've seen that they are being mischievous because what I noticed from uh, or we have noticed from our research, mm -hmm. I mean, our investigation is that they went to the net and googled JB Dankwa. They look at the document and, and Google Dankwa. So when they Google Dankwa, the number of times it pop up made them conclude and then also Google in Chroma. The number of times in Chroma came up, a uh, pop up in, in Dankwa, they saw that the number of times Dankwa pops up is more, is more than the number of times uh, uh, in, in Chroma pops up. So it stands to reason that JB Dankwa is, is, is being favored over uh, Kwame Nkrumah. But that is not the case. In the first time, if you see like this, it says that the, the, at class 2, mm. B2, uh, B1, 2, 3, 5. But see, demonstrate understanding of why Ghana used to be called Gokus. Gokus. So in, 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 in learning about the history of the Gokus, the country, certain part of Ghana was called Gokus. When the Europeans came, Portuguese, Costa de Mina, they give their name because of the prevalence of gold along the coast here. When the Portuguese came, they used the commodities that were prevalent at a particular point. And so per, yeah. the new, per the new syllabus, yeah. the students should know this? Yeah, they should know this. And mm. it was J.B. Dankwa's research, which he gave to UGCC, of which Nkrumah was part, Akwaje was part, Edwede Kufuado was part, William Ofuriata was part, mm. uh, Obeche Vilamte was part. He gave to them and said, based on my research, this is how you should call our country because uh, most of our people in this was, country are... Was J.B. Dankwa missing from the old syllables? No, you didn't have any... Prior to this time, mm. you didn't have any history syllabus. History, since uh, 87, history had not been part of the primary school curriculum. Mm. History was done at secondary school as an elective subject. Mm. So, we, when a, you see, somebody sent me a WhatsApp message, and I could see that he was displaying his ignorance of historiography and even educational development in this country. If you are talking about replacing uh, J.B. Dankwa's name over uh, Nkrumah, and you are saying that uh, that is why we are throwing the old curriculum away, there was nothing like that. Nothing of that existed. This mm. is the first time. Mm. And the reason why we are now doing history, or we are making history uh, a standalone subject, is based on one, the AU provision, the AU Educational Commission, mm. they have a, a, a a, a document called CESA 20, 20, uh, 2025. They are saying that by 2025, every African country should include in its curriculum the history and culture of uh, Africa. Do you get me? So by, uh, by implication, you have to study, because you study, uh, charity begins at home. You have to study your own history before right. you go and study about African uh, history. Right, right, right. And apart from that, we all know, everybody who, has, who is knowledgeable in the historiography of Ghana mm. knows that Trevor Rupa, if you do historiography as a course, the first thing that you'll be taught 
is that Trevor Rupa said that he was Regis Professor of Oxford. He said that Africa did not have history until it came into contact with Europeans, which is also falsehood. It's not borne out by the facts. Africans have history. And it was out of this that researchers like what J.B. Dankwa did, his intellectual output becomes relevant. Do right. you get me? Okay. Because when we study history, we try to show how Africa, a well civilized African also had a civilization before Europeans even came to I'm us. afraid we've got to leave it here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kwame Osekwati. You, you, you are is the chairman of the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment. You still watch and made a live here on TV. Three. Now, uh, Keta Business College, Keta Busco in the Volta region, is in a deplorable state. Now, management is seeking to raise five million cities to roll out a renovation program. Keta Business College, Keta Busco, was founded in 1939 and has not seen any major renovation. Buildings in the school have not been painted for more than 30 years now. Keta Business College lacks a well-equipped library and a science laboratory for smooth academic work. There are no staff bungalows, compelling teachers to stay outside the school premises. Support from the Ghana Education Trust Fund, Get Fund, has not been able to complete projects in the school. The situation has compelled management of the school to set up an endowment fund. The school has targeted to raise 5 million cities. The amount is to be sourced from all students, government and other agencies within a five-year period. National President of the All Student Association, Dr. Seth Anani, was hopeful the amount will help in rehabilitating the school. That if the government is pushing for free education, that everybody should be educated, it is be difficult for government to generate resources to finance every aspect of education. So we are taking it the, bull, the, bull, the bull by the horn, trying to go ahead of government with a strategy. And it is not just done ad hocly, it is a strategy. And that strategy is what we call the transformation agenda. And in that strategy, the endowment fund is coming to pull, it's a fuel that is going to push the generator to make sure that we accelerate the growth that we needed to a category A school in a short time. Director of ICT at the Ministry of Education, Kweju Edu, noted government is committed to providing infrastructure to enhance free SHS program. We believe that effective teaching and learning leads to the expected educational outcomes we seek in this country and that there is a need for better practices and goals for teaching. It is for this reason that the government places a huge premium on education as a fundamental tool for transforming our economic and industrial fortunes. Director in charge of the endowment fund, Dr. Simon Harvey, appealed to corporate agencies to assist. Previously, we raise funds anytime we want to do a project, but we realize that members feel that we've been coming to them too frequent for money. So we want to establish the fund so that everybody is free of this annual ritual of donating money for project. Later, management of the school gave a seed money of 1,830 cities to support the endowment fund. Just watching Media Live here on TV3, still ahead of the bulletin, we've got international news, we've got entertainment, we've got sports news, as well as the very latest in business. You're still watching Media Life here on TV3. We're going to go shortly now to our reporter, Godfrey Tanam, who is at the NPP head office where uh, they're holding a press conference. Thank you very much, Godfrey, for joining us. So what can you report? Yeah, so the NPP organized a uh, press conference this afternoon to uh, tell delegates and uh, to NPP members who want to contest for uh, positions in the newly created region to uh, make up their mind to do that, and this is going to be done on the 18th May, which they describe as an extraordinary conference. So this uh, is going to be in two folds. There will be an extraordinary conference on May 18th, and then there will also be uh, a, a meeting to select uh, position, people for uh, vacant positions in the traditional uh, regions. So from May 
3 to uh, May 5. They will be doing that in uh, both East, northern region and the western region and the voter region. So these are uh, the regions that they will be selecting based on uh, what the General Secretary John Bobby said that uh, uh, on Article 9 of their constitution, they have the mandate to select people to man those uh, positions. But apart from that, the extraordinary conference will take place uh, uh, on it may it is May, uh, which will be, be, be shown. So uh, April 23rd, they will have the nomination open, and then it will close on 26th uh, uh, April, and then the 29th to 30th, they will be vetting, and then second results of vetting will be out. So if anybody has a petition at all to, uh, after the vetting, the 3rd uh, May, you, you have to you have the opportunity to do that, and then the results for the vetting will be out on 6th. Uh, me. So on 18th, the extraordinary conference will take place. All right, thank you very much, uh, Godfrey Tana, reporting live from the NPP headquarters where the party has been outlining uh, measures uh, for its new elections uh, to be held in the new regions that have just been created. You also watch Media Live here on TV3. Up next is the very latest in business news. The business news segment is brought to you by MTN. Everywhere you go, Universal Merchant Bank, West Hills Estates, Eden Heights. Now, the Ghana Revenue Authority is engaging stakeholders for inputs and feedback to inform further actions and decisions on the implementation of its e-payment system. The platform, scheduled to be rolled out before the end of the year, will be used for the payment of personal income tax, vehicle income tax, and the tax stamp. The operations of the Ghana Revenue Authority has been largely manual. The filing of annual and monthly returns, submission of self-assessment estimates, and submission of declarations for purposes of import duty payment are all conducted manually. In 2017, however, the Customs Division started the implementation of the paperless clearance of imported goods. The integrated tax application and preparation system which enables individuals to file their annual personal income tax returns electronically or online has also been launched. Stakeholders, including the Ghana Union of Traders Association, GUTA, transport unions, small scale industries, the police, the media, among others, have been sensitized on the e-payment system scheduled to be implemented before the end of 2019. The platform has been designed to initially enable commercial transport operators who pay their quarterly tasks through the vehicle income tax sticker system, small scale self employed persons who pay their quarterly tasks through the tax stamp to honor the obligations using the mobile money platform. GRA is now looking at more customer focus. And we are looking at how we can help our taxpayers to pay taxes very simple and easy. So our focus here is more of the pain of the taxpayer to comply with the tax laws. Some stakeholders welcomed the move, but cited perceived challenges which should be addressed. Most of the people are, excuse me to say, illiterate, who don't know all the issues on the phone. So I'm wondering how they'll be able to check or pay. Some drivers are not having mobile phone to check that if their time has reached or to renew their, their papers. It's only the policeman who is good. Nowadays, these police, some are good. They will tell you it's not. You haven't paid, but you've paid. The engagement is the beginning of a series of programs nationwide to allow stakeholders to make inputs before finalizing the system. In other news, former Energy Minister Emmanuel Amakofibua has called for the scaling up of security along Ghana's gas pipelines. He was speaking in an interview during a working visit to the Twabo gas plant in the western region by the Parliamentary Committee on Mines and Energy. Here's a report by my colleague Irama Smith. The Parliamentary Select Committee on Mines and Energy was first briefed about work at the plant before a tour of the facility. Speaking in an exclusive interview after the tour, a member of the committee and former energy minister, Emmanuel Ama Kofibua, stated that gas continues to be at the heart of Ghana's energy security and its relevance continues to be more marked. He asked for increased security and safety along the gas pipelines, especially as the Ghana National Gas Company Limited will be transporting over 300 million cubic meters of gas. 
There are critical issues that we also have engaged them on. One, we need to make sure that the pipeline security all the way through the 6th district to Abuaze is something that Ghana guys must make a priority. Uh, the other issue has to do with the community issues we've talked about. How are they engaging the community, each community along the pathway of the pipeline, so that the community is empowered in terms of safety. The vice chairman of the committee, who is also the member of parliament for Takwa in Swaim, George Mirkutuka, expressed satisfaction with their visit. We can't sit in parliament alone and just be monitoring what they do. We need to be here practically to see uh, the things that they do. And we are well uh, informed now uh, in terms of our activities, linking it up to uh, the theoretical aspect of it. So uh, I say uh, congratulations to management. Uh, I know it's not going to end here. We will be coming. And uh, we've also been informed of the intended expansion that they will do in future. I believe the CEO and his team are, are, are doing well. For TV3 News, Erama Smith, Western Region. Well, that'll be all for business. Uh, let's move on to other stories now. And the const on construction work of the Jamestown Fish and Port Complex in Accra is expected to commence in July this year. While well, the Minister for Fisheries and Aquaculture, Elizabeth Afolikwe, made this known when she took her turn at the Mid the Press series in Accra. The $50 million facility is being financed with a grant from China. Fisheries and Aquaculture Minister Elizabeth Afolikwe said geological works is currently being undertaken at the site. The necessary preparatory works, including the drafting of the design and land survey works, have been completed. An intersectoral landing site construction committee to supervise the project has been constituted. She said the ministry would continue to collaborate with other stakeholders to work towards eliminating child labor on the Volta Lake. In 2018, the ministry, with the support of development partners, developed the child labor and trafficking plan to assist curtail the phenomenon of child labor and trafficking that characterizes some of the artisanal and inland fisheries, especially on the Volta Lake. On job creation, she said government intends to create an additional 80,000 direct and indirect jobs under the Aquaculture for Food and Jobs program. The Aquaculture for Food and Jobs complement the ongoing planting for food and jobs of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. At full operation, the program is expected to provide additional 50,000 metric tons of fish over a three-year period for the country. 2,000 youth from the National Builders Corp, NAPCO, will be trained to provide extension services to fish farmers. The first beneficiaries of the Aquaculture for Food and Jobs, AFJ, is the James Camp Prison Fish Farm. The prison was supported with 3,000 fingerlings, 235 bags of fish feed in January 2019. As part of efforts to enhance intersectorial collaboration, the ministry has instituted a national committee on aquaculture comprising experts from the academia, industry and regulators. Elsewhere, UNESCO has launched the 2019 Global Education Monitoring Report, which assesses progress towards sustainable development goal 4 on education and its 10 targets. While the report focuses on migration, displacement and education aimed at building bridges. The report is a third and makes a case for investing in the education of children left behind by migrant parents in countries with high rates of immigration. Speakers at the launch stressed the need to empower children and teachers, advocating that the education and migration laws be consistent. There are groups of little children who are being trafficked into this country, very young very young children. In fact, I mean, I'm shocked because there's usually a policeman standing there and he watches these children actually come and stand in the middle of traffic to beg. They're very young children. They are all wearing some brown scarves. I have no doubt that the older people who sit around there are not their parents, that this is part of a big trafficking ring. I'm not even sure that the children are Ghanaian. I don't know. 
But this is also an assignment. We need to find out. This is about leaving no child behind. National Program Officer in Charge of Education at UNESCO, Prosper Kwesi Nyavo, said UNESCO has been involved in formulating educational policies, though governments take the final decisions. They have financial implications. They have human resource implications. So ours as an organization is to prevent what is possible under all circumstances. And the government has the duty to make its own choices. UNESCO underscored the need for countries to recognize the histories of others, adopt curricula that respect past history and current diversity of migrants. All right, welcome to Entertainment News. Now, where are you going to be this Easter? I know where I'm going to be. Well, all the action will be at the Jakiti this weekend as the much-anticipated Onyo FM Jakiti Easter train storms the tourism destination with fan-filled activities. Now, project lead uh, Bright Asempa is positive that trip to Jakiti will offer revelers the best Easter experience. Jakiti! Jackity. Well, it's obvious you have to be in Jackity. I mean, just for one thing, uh, sign the fan of it, there's a lot to learn about Jackity. Jackity sit on a peninsula with the Akosumbo Dam as well. It's going to be very exciting. Well, there is something about Jackity and the people in uh, there, you know, very hospitable. The four-day fan-packed event begins on Friday, April 19, to Easter Monday. The Unia FM Easter trip to Jackity will afford revelers memorable and unforgettable experience. So great, right from Friday when we get to Jackity, we're going to have the Aquaba night, but of course we're going to have a lot of stopover and the final destination is Jakiti, where we're going to have the Aquaba Bash. And the football gala will be on as well. And in the evening is going to be the street jam, that is the big bash. Yeah. But there is something special about Jakiti this year, and that is what is happening at the Akosombo Volta Hotel. Saturday evening, we're going to enjoy the Koozy Live Band. And uh, right from 6 to 10 p.m. from there, we move to that one night club and uh, we put on our dancing shoes. The fan continues on April 20th, where audience will experience a happy hour jam, followed by an inter-community football gala. A special boat cruise will also be organized on the Volta Lake on Sunday, April 21st. Don't be left out of the fun as the team has lined up an exciting list of activities to thrill patrons. This year is going to be a big bank. Prior has on board and Prior has promised to shake your kitty like never before. You know, they've come together and they are promising us a wonderful performance at the beach the Easter Monday. You have to be there. <laughs> Jackity! All right, so Jackity, it is. Um, I'm going to be there. Uh, you've got to make a date with us for that big bang uh, this Easter season. Now, Kofas Media and Old Films is out with the official trailer of the much awaited movie Away Bus. Now, the story centered on two sisters who had no choice than to um, rob in a bus with the help of. Calibos to raise money to save their dying mother. Now, Away Bus is expected to be premiered on April 20. Uh, the star studded movie features John Domelo, Fela McCaffrey, Salma Mumen, uh, Calibos, Ahonfe Patri, Master Richard, Ajete Anan, and Moisha Budon. And it's set to uh, premiere on April 20 at the Silver Bed Cinemas inside the Accra Mall and West Hills Mall. The treatment. Next. Go angry with me. You understand me? The chip of it. It's gonna be on your best legend and knife, no what GF Kwasia Fuwa in Samana. Mami Daka. Bama wa nanya minti. Minti minari. Minya one. My daughter's don't have money. Robin the bus. Come on, you know boss just last book. There are four rules. One, keep to the plan. Stay focused. Down. Two, speed is key. There is no time to check time. Three, however slow you run, you never get caught. Four, well, I don't remember the fourth rule, but I'm sure with these three rules, you are ready to go. This is a robbery! In this life, there are pillars and there are caterpillars. The pillars are there for support, but the caterpillars destroy. They destroy! What do people say? I am. I'm the spiritual intercontinental bulldozer. 
I go everywhere. We need to raise the sum of 20,000 Ghana cities. If I had that money, I'll be chilling. All right, so that's all for Media Life here on TV3. Thanks very much for watching. My name is Park Kusia Sari. For more news, you can log on to our website, 3news.com. Thanks to the production team. Thanks to uh, the cameramen and the directors. Uh, we'll see you same time uh, tomorrow. God bless.